that's valuable in that sense. But um, the individual certificate is definitely the CISSP is the one that matters. And let me mute these guys so they don't irritate each other. Good. I'm glad you asked. So yeah, that's the most important chart. The others are good on the way there. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know. Um, if you want a batch, if you want a bachelor's degree in computer science, you can go anywhere. But computer science has nothing to do with anything we teach in our department. Um, and I don't think anybody actually wants a degree in computer science. It's just the only thing they offer in college. It's kind of nuts. What people actually want is engineering. Um, and they don't offer it because the four-year colleges are too slow to adapt. Uh, I am not aware. In fact, we are currently planning to partner with Texas because there is no four-year degree in the state of California that touches our topics. And that's why we have to partner with Texas. And in fact, the long-term plan of partnering with Texas is that that will somehow eventually shame a California university into offering this stuff because it's been like 15 years, but they can't move their curriculum to offer something new. Um, and anyway, so other, you'll have to do something different. Now, if you want to do security, you pretty much have to get a master's degree and you have to get a computer science degree beforehand, which will be completely irrelevant, but a sort of formal requirement you have to go through. So uh, this will change, hopefully in about two years. We will have a partnership with Texas where people can continue studying computer networking and security and get a real uh, engineering degree in that, which I think would really be great. I think if you could actually get an engineering degree in computer technology, 90% of the people in computer science would move over there. I think that's what they really wanna do. I don't think they really wanna be doing theoretical studies of operating systems, which is what they're doing. I think they'd actually like to make something real, which is engineering. And computer science has nothing to do with science anyway. I mean, science is where you have a hypothesis and you have an experiment, you prove your hypothesis. They don't do that over there either. It's, it's, what happened is long ago there was math and then they invented these computer science departments to evolve from math. And it was more like science than it was like math, but they never really quite figured out where it belonged. Now I think we figured out pretty clearly that it belongs in engineering, but the traditions are already set putting it somewhere else. Anyway. Um, so we're here. I'm thinking uh, I might move the class next week. I'll send an email if I do and I'll put a sign on the door. It looks to me like 204 down the hall is available and we'll see because that might be better than constantly battling the biologists here. Um, anyway, so uh, however, they got out of here more or less on time today. All right, so we're down to chapter nine here. Uh, this is embedding op embedded operating systems. And if you're using the old version of the textbook, this is the one chapter that is not in the book but you can probably learn enough from the slides to do it. Um, so this is the point, we'll talk about what embedded operating systems are. This is the Internet of Things, of course. All kinds of devices that never used to be computers and never used to be networked are now networked computers, and that leads to a whole new generation of security problems, and that's what we're going into here. So embedded operating systems are computers that are specialized. An all-purpose computer like the Mac or PC, you can put on any program you want and do whatever you want. But if you get an embedded device like a cell phone, uh, at least a dumb phone, for example, has very limited space. The other cell phones, you can put on apps and everything. But an ATM machine, for example, just does one thing. And there's no way you can install other software or do something else on it. You can't do word processes on an ATM. Although the hardware, in principle, could run that. And it's often actually running Windows XP anyway. So it's not very far from this computer just because it's cheaper to use mass-produced parts that are intended for another purpose, but it is specialized to one purpose, and that's the game. Um, all these devices are running embedded operating systems, and what these are is stripped-down versions of all-purpose operating systems in practice just because that's the easiest way to make them. So you want to make them so they run on uh, cheaper hardware, and you want them to use less power and less RAM and less hard drive storage and such. And most of those embedded devices don't even have any hard drive. They just have a flash drive to contain the operating system and some RAM. So uh, you typically recycle code. This is universal. Nobody wants to write another printer driver. You just get some guy write a printer driver for Windows. Somebody modifies it for Linux, and then you just use it. Everybody uses the same code. And the same thing's true of cryptographic libraries and login systems and graphics libraries and everything. There's just a standard libraries, and everybody just reuses that code. And that has led to uh, quite a few entertaining disasters 
where some large library has a problem like image magic, which is used for almost every Linux based manip image manipulation. There was a vulnerability in that and it hit almost all Linux servers for a while. That's the problem with reusing code, but it saves an enormous amount of effort and that makes it undeniable that everybody would rather reuse code. It does create, in a sense, a single point of failure. Um, so both Windows and Linux have vulnerabilities. Windows got in the game with Windows Compact Edition, which I think was based on Windows XP. And they actually went so far as to release the source code for at least some of that so people could audit it because the open source people, um, the Linux people have sort of a religion, which comes from the uh, early days at MIT, that information should be free and code should be free and everybody should be able to modify software. And so they try politically to stop people from using closed products like the Mac and the, um, and the PC. And so they often even sue, claiming it is illegal for the government to use Microsoft software because it's not open source. And we should have the right to audit the source code and see what it's doing. And on occasion, uh, Microsoft has released some or all of its source code for auditing. This is what Kaspersky announced a couple of weeks ago they were gonna do. Very, the United States government is very, very angry at Kaspersky. They said they stole the NSA exploits through Kaspersky software and we should quit using it and sales are plummeting in America, and Kaspersky has offered to let their source code be audited by third parties to verify that they didn't put a backdoor in it, and most people say that it's not gonna do them any good, because it doesn't change the fact that the Russian government still has root on your machine. Uh, anyway, um, so Windows 10 IoT is Microsoft's latest attempt to get into the Internet of Things space. Uh, since Windows Server 2008, Microsoft has woken up to this issue. In the past, um, in the days of, say, Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows 2000, Microsoft was famous for bloatware. Every version of the OS was like four times bigger than the last one. You had to get a bigger hard drive, more RAM, more processor, until everybody said, what is all this junk? Because it's an all-purpose operating system. It does everything, so that means 90% of it you're not using. Uh, but it's all there. And they got so many complaints about that, they actually started tripping it down with Vista. And they started making it smaller and faster because people complained, uh, like enterprises complained, that they kept having to buy new hardware every few years because the new version of Windows wouldn't run on the old hardware. And gamers complained that it wasn't fast because they really want to win the game and that means they got to be fastest. So Windows 7 started running faster than XP and Windows 8 was supposedly faster than Windows 7. And they also went to the server side. This is one of the many advantages of Linux. A Linux expert can totally just throw away 95% of it and it still runs. And there are versions of Linux that are one megabyte in size that run on a floppy disk. You know, Linux has been around forever and you can do stuff with very small Linuxes. So if you want to make a device and you want it to run fast and cheap, you can, a good Linux expert can make a version of Linux that will run on really old, really weak, really low power hardware. And you can't do that with Windows. It's this big monstrous bloat waiver. So to fix that, they started having Windows Server Core, which is what Microsoft recommends using on servers. Because one of the many things the Linux people said is why in the world do you have a graphic desktop and a mouse and three dimensional graphics and rotating windows on a server? Nobody is supposed to be sitting at the desktop typing and surfing the web on a server. It's supposed to be locked in a closet and only being connected to over the internet. It should be headless, which means it should just have a command prompt. No graphics, no mouse, no nothing, and people should just be controlling it with command line the way you do with like an Amazon Web Services machine. And that's what Server Core does, a stripped down version. And when Microsoft has jumped on board with this, now they have Windows IoT Core to try to help Windows shrink. Of course, the huge advantage is it's much easier for your developers to write Windows software, usually, than for them to write Linux software. There are people who know how to write Linux software, but they're not very thick on the ground. And you, one of the things about Linux, which you, I don't know if it's still true, five years ago, somebody would punch you in the face if you said this, Linux is hard to use. Linux on the desktop is a loser. It never got above like one or 2% because the GUI never works. You click on things and it doesn't work. You can't play the games, you can't play the videos. All kinds of support stuff you need is just not there. So it is pretty miserable to try to live the day on Linux. And most people go to the Mac or the PC for the actual machine they use. And you leave Linux on a server where you don't expect any of that frivolous stuff and you just want the essentials to run fast. Yeah. Um, it might be off topic, but, uh, those Chromebooks, yeah. Uh, uh, Chromebooks are running Linux, Chrome OS, which is somewhat related to Ubuntu. They are a strange Linux laptop, and originally 
they were very dependent on Google services. And really, you were just using like a browser. It was sort of a big cell phone. Now people say they're running more and more things locally. I got some and worked on them. Uh, the problem with Chromebooks is, at least in the ones uh, available four years ago, they were totally locked into one specific modified kernel. You couldn't change it, and you could not run any virtual machines on them. So the point of Chromebooks is to be limited, like an iPhone or an iPad, not that you can put any kind of software on it, but they won't have any malware, and they'll be very efficient and fast at doing simple things. And so some people really like them. Um, you don't have to worry about malware, and you can do web browsing and word processing and stuff, uh, but you're pretty much stuck with a few programs. I think it's somewhat better now. It's a good question, though. And that's where a lot of people think you're going. I know, told, I know in, I read that in South Korea and Japan, most people don't even own a computer. They just have a really good cell phone, like a $1,000 cell phone, and they do everything on that. And that's where they think the world is going. All these heavy devices are on the way out presumably be replaced by mobile devices. And that's why Microsoft is very, very worried. And this is why Ballmer was throwing chairs at people about 10 years ago for having temper tantrums in his office, because Microsoft cannot get onto cell phones or tablets. They are nowhere. Even when they make very good products, like the Surface Pro 3 and the Surface Pro 4 is a very powerful computer. They're very good, but nobody uses them. And my, uh, the Windows Phone of various versions, people tell me it was really a very good product, but nobody used them because it didn't have any reason not to use an iPhone or an Android and use it instead. If you're going to walk into a market space that is totally owned by another company, your product must be a lot better or a lot cheaper. And it wasn't. And so they couldn't get in. They never got even up to 1% usage on mobile devices. And a lot of people at Microsoft are very worried about this. They think the future is mobile devices and they won't be there but they're still turning record profits on Windows 7. And Windows 10 is pretty much a hit too, so they're still making money for their investors, but how much longer are people really gonna have these big heavy things on their desk with Windows on them? Our city college network traffic has been down in single digits for five years of Windows use. 90% 90, 90 of the use is Mac and Android. So that's where open source won on portable devices. And the Internet of Things, too. However, there are a lot of things still running Windows XP, um, like aircraft ticket consoles, ATM machines, voting machines. A lot of those are running Windows XP embedded. Anyway, so VxWorks is another one that's been around for a long time. It's used in spacecraft. It's not intended for a normal desktop. It's intended only for equipment. Um, it looks like that. And you have an op a panel where you design the OS. You say what features you want to put in. This is kind of like Microsoft's Ad Remove uh, Windows component window in control panel. You can just choose which parts of the operating system you need and not put on the others and just create something that is adapted approximately to your hardware requirements. Uh, Green Hill makes military uh, embedded systems like for strike for fighters and such. Um, and this, of course, has to reach the military standards of security. There's a thing called the Orange Book. Um, you'll hear a lot about it if you take the CISSP class. The um, United States military defines certain security requirements for computers, and everybody has to meet those requirements or they can't sell to the military or to military contractors or anybody who makes stuff that goes to the military, so it becomes really important to meet those standards. And uh, that's here. The QNX is a Cisco's high-end router. Now, if you take the Cisco classes here, you learn how to run Cisco's iOS with a capital I, which is not the OS on iPhones. That came later with a small I. It was Cisco's OS, which is very, very, very primitive. It is like MS-DOS. It has only a few commands. They're sort of screwy. A bunch of them are 20 years out of date, referring to technology that isn't there anymore. It is amazingly old, and Cisco hangs on to it as their proprietary operating system. The engineers at Cisco we're very, very frustrated by this, using this antique product, trying to patch it to meet modern requirements. They said, why don't we throw this away and use Unix? Cisco management didn't care, so they broke away and formed Juniper. And Juniper runs on BSD Unix, and it is so much better. <laughs> if you take the Cisco classes and learn iOS, and then you use Juniper, it's like getting out of prison. Because um, Unix is very logical. And it's a living, anyway, but the fact is that's what they have their iOS for their small routers like we use in class. And then they, Cisco is alone for the big router market. If you're an ISP and you have an enormous amount of traffic to move, you got to buy Cisco equipment. They have these things that can move incredible amounts, rack after rack full of servers. And that is running not the same OS they teach you here. It's running this thing, um, QNX. That's what they use for the really massive routers. And uh, 
Nobody is competing in that market space. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why Microsoft makes so much money. Nobody is competing in the domain controller space. If you have a multinational company with 10,000 computers across two continents, three continents, you have to have Microsoft domain controllers. There is nothing else you can buy that will do what you need to do at that level. Push out security updates to all those machines, make a partnership with another company, handle a buyout where you buy a whole other company and put them in your network. Microsoft is there for you. They've got that stuff all ready to go and they have training classes and certifications. You can get staff that will be able to do that stuff and make it work and there's no other OS competing in that space at all. And in the same spirit, Cisco owns high-end routers. There's plenty of competition for the low end, like home routers and stuff, but not for the high end. Then you've got real-time OSs. Here's one of them uh, used in space systems, uh, spacecraft and fighters. You can't be uncertain how long it's going to take to act. You may have noticed on uh, your PC, if you like click a button, sometimes it's a while before it notices because it's busy doing something else. And that's okay for a home user surfing the internet, and that is really not okay for a car or a jet fighter that you press the like, brakes and it says, oh no, I gotta finish this update before I turn on the brakes. That's not acceptable. Um, all right, so there's two kinds of kernels. The kernel is the heart of the operating system. It's a small bit of code that must always be in RAM, and it's the only part of the code that is actually permitted to use every command in the processor. In particular, it's the only part of the operating system that is allowed to talk directly to the hardware. So if you want to print something from Microsoft Word, Microsoft Word cannot send a signal to the printer. All it can do is send a request to the kernel saying, kernel, please print this stuff. And the kernel then does the printing because your user line programs are not authorized to directly send anything out to external ports. And that's by design. Now that does mean that you have this special part of the operating system, the kernel, that must be ready and everything else is always using it. And there are two general ways to do it. The one on the left is the monolithic kernel. This is the general, most common type. This is where you have multiple layers like the OSI networking model. This turned out to be a huge hit. You have so many different pieces of software being used in your computer. You've got hardware down here, and instead of the people that write word processors up in the application layer having to understand what your printer is and modify their word processor every time a new printer comes out, they divide the labor this way. So if you buy a new printer, the printer manufacturer writes a device driver, you put it in the kernel, and your word processor doesn't even know anything about it or care. They just send a request, print something to the operating system. It goes through various layers here. It hits that. And then the operating system offers you a choice of printers, including the new printer. The word processor does not need to know this has happened or care. The same thing in a company. You have layers. You have management and middle management and then supervisors and then workers. And you know, management doesn't have to know every little thing the workers are doing. They pass through layers. This is the most efficient way for each person to have one job they can understand and do, and the whole thing works together when it works. This is wasting hardware and memory, if you want to look at it that way. Since everything is separated and written separately, it creates a certain type of bug where you hand a job off from one layer to another layer, and it might be misunderstood. The next layer might be written in a different language. It's certainly written by different developers. And often in Microsoft world, you bought them from other companies. So you're patching together pieces that were not really written to work together. So there are some defects, but it is the most efficient way to make a general purpose system that is easily adapted to changes. So this is what multi-purpose computers have. However, if you really want to get the most out of your hardware and you're not going to be changing your hardware because you're making a device, a microkernel OS is the most efficient. You do not have layers. Instead, you uh, just have the hardware and you have the smallest possible layer and all these things are sitting on top, like the drivers and uh, file servers and such, each running as fast as they can. Now, if you change anything, you have to modify a bunch of code here. But if you don't change anything, it's smallest and fastest, uses less memory and everything. So those are the two general philosophies. Um, this is a general purpose OS, perhaps stripped down a little to run on your device. This is a special OS that's really been customized for your hardware. All right, Unix is very common in embedded devices. As I say, it's taken over the mobile marketplace. Everybody's phone is now Unix. It's either Android, which is Linux, or iPhone, which is Unix, and there's essentially nothing else being used out there anymore. It's all below 1%. So the open source community won there, 
Um, anyway, so the monolithic one OS is used by a lot of devices just to make it cheaper and easier to build them. A device like a, a medical device on a table where it's perfectly okay for it to require a little more hardware and a little more power because it's going to be sitting on a table and plugged in. But the portable devices like your phone don't have that luxury. Anyway, so um, you can add more features easily to a monolithic operating system. It's very much like a desktop operating system. Another option you have is real-time Linux. Like I said, you can put a microkernel extension in Linux, which will make it an RTOS. The point of an RTOS is you know exactly how long the delay is between a request and servicing the product. You do not have all these background processes running that can make you wait, and that is necessary for certain applications. Your car, for example, when you step on the brakes, you are no longer connected to anything that hits the brakes. When you step on the brakes, you send a software signal to a computer that says, please hit the brakes. Uh, this happened, I think, 10 years ago, and a lot of people don't know it. They imagine that they're physically connected to the brakes the way they used to be, but that hasn't been true for a long time. And I hope it's an RTOS doing it. It doesn't seem to be Windows because that was the big joke when computers got in cars. They say you're going to have to like turn off your car and restart it and it's going to just have crash and have an update while you're driving. And that stuff hasn't happened, but it certainly could happen. Anyway, so you can put Linux on your router. Uh, routers, your home router that you get is an interesting example of this. Your home router has standard chips in it. There are really only like three or four kinds of chips used in routers. And they put different brand names on them just to seem like there's more, but there aren't. And so it has all the features of an enterprise class router, like a $600, $300 router, but the software doesn't let you use them. They put on software which limits it to your home version, sort of like Windows XP Home Edition. There used to be a limited version of Windows, and there were pirate hacks that would turn it into the professional version. So you can replace the firmware in your router and get the full control of the hardware, and then you can turn on all sorts of features that are missing, like graphs of bandwidth, scanning the wireless network to find the channels, limiting people, uh, running VPNs on it, all sorts of things. The problem is it's less stable when you do that because the OS you're putting on is a generic open source OS, not really customized to that specific hardware. So most of the people I know that run um, routers at businesses as like tech support tell me that they've learned to quit using these custom things because they crash more. Just using the official firmware that comes with the router is probably likely to stay up longer. But GDWRT is here, and so one of the many things you'll get is bandwidth monitoring. You can see how much bandwidth people are using and limit it, which you can't do with the official firmware because the hardware supports it. It's just the software that's not supporting it. And OpenWRT is another one, whole series of these. Uh, like a lot of open source products, a lot of open source products go out of their way to slap you in the face with the fact that they do not work at a corporation. So they have lewd pictures on things, jokes on things, and here they name every version after a drink and they give you the drink. But just to remind you that they didn't have to pass this through management. Um, that's why I remember there was a, a blog post I read from one of the major companies about five years ago, and they said, you know, Ubuntu is a great product, and I'm really tired of Windows, and I would like to use it, but I cannot go to management and say, let's use something named Feisty Fawn. They will not, the board of directors will just fire me. I wish you guys would knock it off and have a professional sounding name, like Linux Red Hat version seven, Enterprise version seven. That I can sell to management. I cannot sell Feisty Fawn to management. And there's kind of some truth in that because that frivolous attitude carries through. And I remember when I, I was in fact using a version of Red Hat and it couldn't connect to an NTFS disk. So if you had a dual boot with Red Hat and Windows, it couldn't see the Windows disk. So I went to the official documentation and it said there, we can't figure out how to do this. If you figure out how, email the code to us. And I said, you know, when you ask Microsoft a question, you don't get an answer like that. That's the kind of, you know, they don't tell you, why don't you write it and give it, send it to us. So that's, there's a problem with the requirements of corporations and the frivolity of open source. There's a culture problem there. Anyway, OpenWRT is very nice. It will give you a graphical installation screen and you can now install all these additional optional components. You can put a VPN on your router, you can put on IP version six, you can filter things, you can do content filtering, you can do all kinds of things right on the router. Of course, it's running on this weak firmware without much processor, without much RAM, so if you try to turn on too many of these things, it'll slow down and not work very well, but it is the sky's the limit. All right. So these embedded OS have vulnerabilities just like every other OS, and they have spreading worms. Uh, here, Cybot was one of the early ones that attacked home routers. This was all the rage about four years ago. They would take over people's home routers, 
because most people get a router that has a default factory password and they never change it, so it's very easy. Uh, there was a guy that took over 100,000 home routers and used it to do a port scan of the whole internet and publish the results, um, which is fantastically illegal, but it was sort of scientific research. Um, this one here would take over a lot of routers, uh, started in Australia, and see it does a, it says armed with 6,000 common usernames and 13,000 passwords. So it just does a brute force attack, trying passwords to get on each router. And uh, here's Windows Mobile, has the usual plethora of vulnerabilities, just a series of them coming out. Um, every version, one big problem with home devices and Internet of Things devices is they're very rarely updated. And often they're not, it's not even provided any way to update them. The manufacturer thinks if you want an update, you should throw it away and buy the new one. Um, so that's a problem. And this is getting more and more serious as time goes on. The biggest, it, the Mirai botnet of last year was one of the huge uh, latest problems. The Internet of Things problem is just beginning and it's getting worse and worse. Anyway, and now we, uh, so ways to profit from hacking. You can take over ATM machines and steal money out of them, although I do not know of any attack that stole any large amount of money by hacking the machines. Um, the, the main way you steal money out of ATMs is by stealing the information on the ATM card and making fake ATM cards, and that's been used to steal millions. Anyway, uh, the awareness of the popular world of this problem started in 1999 when they realized that the Y2K flaw came out. The software that was written in COBOL, which was very popular in the 70s and 80s, used a two-digit year, and they didn't. nobody thought about what would happen in the year 2000 where some of that software will think it's actually 1900 and not 2000 and this do the wrong thing. Like put your buses on a weekend schedule instead of weekday schedule and or people getting like phone bills for like 100 years of phone call because your phone call appears to have lasted for 100 years now and that sort of thing. So they had to go and patch all that stuff and this made a big stir as everybody suddenly realized how many devices were now computerized and dependent on software um, which you had not considered. Things like water pumps and sewage pumps were now computer controlled and people thought those were just old fashioned mechanical devices. And now we're much more dependent on computer devices than ever. And they're under attack. Hackers and terrorists and everybody trying to take them over. And our government is trying very hard to reassure people that we have protected these devices, but the fact is we have not protected them at all. There is nobody you can call. There are no cyber cops that can save you. As we all know, everybody's getting hacked all the time. We do not have any effective protection for all these devices. And instead of doing that, we are just having more and more and more cheap devices flooding the market. Now people have their home lighting and their home garage door opener and a burglar alarm. And now you're going to let Amazon unlock your front door to let people deliver a package. And Everybody's just filling their life with more and more of these devices, and there are no real security standards anywhere. No government inspection, no protection. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're going to have more and more security disasters until we get some kind of handle on this. Um, and you're almost all connected to the Internet, because whatever you do, it would be so much more fun if it was connected to the Internet, that that's irresistible. Even though it's more dangerous, it's more fun to have your device controlled over the Internet from your phone. So this means you... Um, the Mirai botnet was one of the big things that happened to change this. This was the end of last year. This was a DDoS attack, which was, again, the biggest DDoS that could possibly be delivered by the Internet backbone. For like the last three years, the DDoSs that real big criminals use to take people down are just as big as they can possibly be, which means there is no more capacity of the Internet to deliver more packets than this. And this was 620 gigabytes gigabits per second. And this was a botnet consisting of webcams and routers, and all it had was a long list of names and passwords for all kinds of popular devices, and it would just get in with the default passwords in these devices and make a giant botnet. And it was good, clean fun. It might still be there. I did this at the time. You could just uh, install some software on a server and open a Telnet port, and you would just see the attacks come in. It would start within 10 seconds. It would try logging into your server, if you're listening on Telnet, and uh, hoping your webcam. If you're on the right software that impersonates your webcam a little bit, you'll see them come in. They would just be trying this list, and by just trying the default passwords, they'd find a lot of devices to take over and use them. Uh, one thing that was kind of crazy about it is they couldn't own the device. So another, after what, use your device to attack somebody for a while, somebody else would come and take it over because the password is still the default password and use it in this other botnet for a while. That happens a lot. That one thing criminals do a lot is steal another criminal's botch. Anyway, so it's difficult to patch these things. Your desktop operating system has some kind of automatic update feature, but the uh, 
the embedded devices typically do not. They might have no update feature at all, and even if they do have an update feature, most people never use it because it's inconvenient and they don't really see the need to. If it's working, why would you change it? All right. Uh, so open source software is one option here. If you use open source software, you're tying to the large community of people contributing software, and that can save you money. Um, the Linux kernel is estimated to be tens of billions of dollars worth of programming that has been spent to develop it, which is true. Um, and you can then tie, if you do something, like the Cisco engineers did to move to Juniper, like tie yourself to one of the main streams, like BSD Unix, and there are even security patches and intelligent people on mailing lists and people maintaining everything. You don't have to pay for any of that. Other people are developing patches as long as you connect yourself to one of the main streams. It's certainly a wise decision if you can do it. Um, pacemakers, here's another one at DEF CON from 2008. Uh, medical devices in general were designed with no thought of computer security at all. There's a big uh, campaign called I Am The Cavalry run by Josh Corman that's been building up steam and now it's got friends in Washington and lawyers and Department of Justice and these people are meeting to talk about this. They're just beginning to realize that all these electronic medical devices are networked and that's a vulnerability. Um, hey bud. All right. And uh, I guess we're down to some cahoots. Let's try them. And I've already got the uh, streaming going, so the remote attendees should be able to see it. My cahoots are here. And this one is the one, so there we go. All right. seconds. Yeah, they're still coming in. 11-1. All right, I'll wait another 10 seconds. Ah, they're dropping out. All right. Okay, I think I better start before they lose more people. All right, four questions. All right, which one is used in spacecraft? All right, that's VxWorks. All right, what's the most common type of embedded OS? All right, monolithic is the most common. Uh, the other one is more work. And usually it's worth having a little more hardware requirements to make it easier to develop and maintain the software. So the most of them monolithic. All right, what OS is used on routers? All right, that's GDWRT. All right, and what's the botnet that took over webcams? Was the Mirai botnet? All right, let me record the winner is Frodo and Chad and E. That's not the real Chad. Is that you? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, you're also all three of these people. Are you? What are you, Frodo? Yeah. 
Okay, who, who's, <laughs> the only one I don't know is E. E should let me know who they are. All right. And by the way, there was, there was somebody last week who never figured out who they were, and they didn't get their point. Um, so this is one problem with anonymity. If you conceal your name, then uh, if you success, Kaji. Kaji. One last time. So if you are Kaji, let me know. You didn't get your points. You also have a message on your Zoom if you ask. There's a message here? Oh, there is a message. Oh, good. That might be telling me who somebody is. E, good. Okay. Now I know who E is. Good. Okay. So I will know who's here tonight. If Kaji reappears, he can claim some points. All right. So um, I think we might as well go a little further before we take a break here. So. Uh, you've got your networking devices, like your routers, firewalls, and switches are also running an OS, and that's their embedded devices. Uh, your general purpose computers are, of course, out there, and you can take over the routers. And if you do, you can modify the network conditions. At first, this might seem crazy, but you can launch attacks from a router, which is now inside your firewall, and you can um, compromise your router and do things like add malware to all the files that download through the router, and all these attacks have happened. Uh, routers typically have authentication bypass vulnerabilities. This is very common in the small business and home router especially. There's supposed to be a place where you have to log in as administrator to do things, but they typically have common web vulnerabilities there. Uh, there's been a router hacking contest from years ago and another one on more recently where people that know how to do vulnerability um, uh, detection can very easily hack into routers. They're typically designed very sloppily using unsafe web authentication procedures. So you can do things like change cookies or just go directly to access objects without passing through the login page or look in the source code and find the password in there, things like that. Um, this D-Link was a pretty good one. I made a video of this one. This was pretty hilarious. If you were a D-Link router, all you had to do was have this special user agent string in your browser that included the word backdoor backwards. And if you connected with that user agent, you are now permanently administrator on the router. In fact, there was no way, every user was now administrator from that point forward until you rebooted the router. It was pretty amazing. Um, and that's obviously a backdoor put in there for some kind of de temporary development purpose and not removed. So uh, there's all these other devices out there, printers, scanners, fax devices, and the multifunction devices that combine those. And these things are typically never updated, vulnerable, and not considered. Uh, the In year 2001, I think, came a worm that spread into the printers called Bugbear. And it fouled up a lot of people. You would re-image the machines, reboot the machines, and they're all infected immediately because it's hiding in the printer. So, I mean, they're just another network device. You can hack into them, too. And if you do take over the printer, now you can steal the print jobs, which may have confidential data. You can change the settings of the printer so it spreads malware to other devices. You can change, uh, there's a bunch of hacking tools just for hacking printers. You can change the message on the printer to be something insulting. You can add extra pages or mocking images to things that get printed. And you can change the page that pops up when it runs out of paper to load malware on machines that view that page and stuff. You know, you can, it's just, if you have already a device on a network, you can use it to do a lot of harm. And so you also, firmware updates on printers and IP phones are typically insecure. They're typically done with TFTP, unencrypted and unauthenticated. So if you can run a malicious TFTP server anywhere on the network and then say reboot the printer or send it some kind of message to update the firmware, it will then upload poison firmware. And now you can make it do anything you want. Um, and same thing's true of phones. And for that matter, routers and firewalls and switches typically all have a TFTP update because it dates from a time when you would update them from a trusted machine over a point-to-point -point serial connection, not in the LAN. And they continue to use this insecure method uh, for emergency recovery, if nothing else. SCADA systems are computer devices intended to control industrial equipment. I see them in the street controlling the traffic lights and the walk signals. They control factory equipment, power plants, uh, manufacturing equipment. I remember I used I went on show data a couple of years ago and I found the SCADA devices there that were just wide open that were controlling like a tomato canning plant in Italy. And you could see how many cans are going by and what's happening to them and stuff. Um, they're typically all over the place. They are supposed to be 
separated from the internet by an air gap. That is what the manufacturers will tell you in the manuals as you put it in there and not connect it to the internet. But of course, then you don't get as much value out of it, so everybody does. Um, this one became more interesting later. The United States military announced this Project Aurora in 2007 where they infected an electric motor, uh, probably the SCADA system controlling it, with malware, and they then blew up the motor and destroyed it. And they had a video of that. And this was obvious when Stuxnet came out. This was the military practicing for Stuxnet. The exciting thing at this time was the discovery that a software attack can destroy hardware, which had been sort of a rumor up until this time, but uh, this is what proved. You really can destroy hardware by messing with the software. And so then Stuxnet came out, which was the United States and Israeli military campaign to stop the nuclear program in Iran. So they identified the Iranian centrifuges that were refining the uranium, which were American products from Siemens, and they made software that would go across an air gap and infect them and destroy them. And it went across the air gap by infecting USB sticks as soon as you plugged them in. So when you plug in a USB stick in a Windows machine, it would get infected, and when you plug it in another Windows machine that's on the other side of the air gap, it will infect that machine, and it would then carefully watch to see if it was the target machine. And only if it was the specific Siemens controllers being used in Iran for nuclear isotope separation would it take effect, and then it would make the machines run a little fast and a little slow in a way that would prevent them from doing their job and break them. And this uh, was very successful. using It was very sophisticated, used for zero days, and uh, the stories are that the Iranians could not figure out what was going on, and they concluded that their own scientists were were sabotaging the equipment, and they started executing their own scientists for sabotaging the equipment because they blamed them. They And shortly after this is when Iran said, we're just going to leave the Internet entirely and make our own Internet. We've just had it with you because we're hacking them over and over and over again. It's really no fun for the Iranian government to be on the normal Internet. We are too dangerous. Anyway, but they never did that yet. They never had their own secret Internet yet. Anyway. And then there's, so uh, I looked in the book for SCADA vulnerabilities. There's this recommendation that you should have an air gap protecting them from the internet. And many people that actually work in this space say this is nonsense. They say nobody has an air gap. Everybody connects it straight to the internet. So you can remotely connect. Your boss can call you and say, our, our equipment in Pennsylvania is down, fix it. So they don't put an air gap in. Now what they ought to do is put a VPN concentrator in. So there's a special device that requires you to have a name and password, or even better, a certificate or two-factor authentication to get in, and then you could connect it remotely, but it would be more secure. And that's how you protect a device you cannot patch. You put a guard in front of it to limit who gets at it, but a lot of them don't. So I wanted to show you this DRAC video, but I think we'll take a break, a 10-minute break before I do that. Um, so we'll pick up right at 7. And I guess I'll stop this and break the lecture into two pieces. Might as well. And uh, I'll come back in 10 minutes.